Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Andrew O'Hare, executive editor at Salon.com. Very honored to be joined today by CNN's national security correspondent. Is that is that the right is that the right title? Analyst, senior, senior. national security analyst. Well, I'm senior only by age, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Shuto. Uh, welcome, Jim. Thank you. Good and, to be here. Uh, your new book is called "The Return of Great." Powers, Russia, China, and the Next World War, a title that's going to scare the crap out of a certain mm. number of people. We can get to that. And I was just observing that the term great powers is one that we associate yeah. not just with the last century, but mm. the early part of the last century. Yeah. So you're like deliberately doing kind of a callback here. Because I do believe that we are, that this relative period of peace that we've enjoyed, particularly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that 30 year period is over. And, and we were back back to, to open, not conflict, but certainly competition, and in some places conflict, among the great powers with great power tactics, right? The gloves are off. And, and, and the, what really brought me to that, and the signs of this have been there for some time, right? You know, Putin already was slicing off pieces of European countries in Georgia and Ukraine in 2014 and elsewhere. China was making a big land grab in the South China Sea. But as I was in Ukraine in February 2022, mm -hmm. As the tanks rolled across the border and the first cruise missiles started falling on Kyiv, etc., it struck me that he just started the biggest land war in Europe since World War II. All bets were off. That, that period is done. We are back to this period of really just bald-faced competition and, and on multiple fronts, not, not just in terms of land grabs like Ukraine or the threat to Taiwan, but also basically open cyber warfare, the weaponization of space, sure. Um, extrajudicial killings around the world, you know, again, th things that seem from another time are, are now very present with the ingredients, at least, of an open great power conflict. We're not there, and, and I spent a good deal of the book talking about ways to avoid getting there, yeah. but this is meant as a, as a warning that we have the ingredients for that, we have to be aware of it, and we have to find ways to avoid the worst outcomes. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, a lot to consider. <laughs> I, I think that uh, people on all sides, including you, would probably agree. One of the ways to interpret what you just said is that the era of a unipolar world where the United yeah. States was the dominant superpower, we all have to deal with the fact that that era is yeah. over. Um, I guess the big question is, what changed mm -hmm. that caused that era to end? And, you know, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Well, it's uh, one of the one of the danger points is that it's not just a bipolar world, Definitely right? Not, U.S. Right. and the old Soviet Union. It is now a tripolar war, world least, where you, you have yeah. U.S., Russia, and China, and then a whole host of middle powers that are playing the game in different ways. You see increasingly Iran and North Korea mm -hmm. allied with Russia, supplying arms to. Um, to, to them in Ukraine, you see Russia supplying weapons to Hezbollah in uh, in, in Lebanon. So you, you have those other layers. But but big picture, three powers competing. Two of them, Russia and China, aligned in many ways. This low, no limits partnership that they've advertised in, in there. Uh, so it, it's it's a it's a return. It's a new Cold War, but a more dangerous one because you have more players and more adversaries. And in addition to uh, the loss of the U.S., that brief period where the U.S. was the, the world's lone superpower. The of history. <laughs> there, there's a longer period, you know, e even going back to the last Cold War, where, where we did benefit from and become used to a rules-based international order. And I know that that sounds, it's become sort of a wonky term that, that it, and it even has taken on partisan overtones Indeed. in this country because it's called globalist by people on the right, etc. But the fact is, it did largely help keep the world from going to war, a great power war, going back to World War II, a general recognition of, of the sovereignty of nations, a general recognition of borders that you can't just say, invade Poland, right? And, right, and, and right. say, you know, what are you gonna do about it? And that's why I say, and I feel, and I, and I felt this as I was sitting in Ukraine two years ago, that it really is a 1939 moment. And it, it's a change, you, you have, in Putin and Xi, two leaders who want to change the status quo, because they see the status quo is not in their interest, and it's a test for us. How do we respond? Do we accommodate? Do we appease? What are the dangers of appeasement? Isn't there a danger in citing a direct parallel with 1939? Mm. Because every situation is different, and I don't personally see the evidence. I'm not going to say anything in defense of Vladimir Putin, sure. but I don't see the evidence that he has 
Hitler-style ambitions mm. to conquer the entirety of Europe. It's yes. not realistic, among other things. So it's interesting. I had a chat about this last night with a friend of mine, Ryan Lizza, at, uh, at Politico, because Indeed. he was making the point that you know Hitler comparisons can become overdone. You know, it's not the first time folks have said, oh, this guy is like Hitler. Yes, you indeed. go back to Saddam Hussein, you know, Kuwait, etc. Um, let me make the case. And, and I'm not saying he's equivalent, right? There has okay. been no Holocaust, right? I mean, yeah. he's been guilty of enormous crimes uh, against civilians. We've seen it in, in his own country, in Ukraine, etc. But no, he's not Hitler in that sense. But in terms of his territorial ambitions, there are parallels. Uh, no, he does not want to take over all of Europe, but he certainly wants to restore uh, the old mother Russia, and if not absolutely take the territory, at least reestablish his sphere of influence over the old uh, Soviet states. And that mm -hmm. clearly includes Ukraine, because, and he says, it's not even a country. It's right. part of Russia. Ask the 40 million Ukrainians, they think differently, just saying, um, and have made repeated decisions and elections to show they say, think differently, but it's not just them. The way he talks about the Baltics is very similar. They don't really, they're, they're, and that's a big problem because they're NATO allies. Right. The way he now talks about Transnistria, this tiny little sliver of Moldova that mm -hmm. no one ever heard about, except <laughs> that's his next attempt to pull it back in. Okay, so it doesn't go all the way to Normandy, right, Hitler style, but he's willing to uh, roll tanks across the border to redraw the borders of Europe, which does have parallels w with Hitler. And, and he's willing to kill a lot of people to achieve those aims. Well, you make, you make the point repeatedly in this. You clearly have spent time in Estonia, a country mm -hmm. people don't know very much about. And the uh, Estonian authorities appear convinced yeah. of the argument that you just laid out, that yeah. Putin has territorial ambitions that include their tiny little mm -hmm. country, who was formerly part of the Soviet Union. Not long ago. Not very long ago. But that's not, that opinion is not widely shared by NATO and, uh, and U.S. You know, well, I would say not, un, not unanimously shared, but I wouldn't say it's, it's a minority report, as it were. So, so what I noticed traveling Europe, and, and I did spend time, and I, by the way, I love the Estonians, and I'll tell you why, <laughs> uh, and I think we should all have enormous respect for them. Uh, you, you do have a difference in Europe between East and West, and that the Eastern-facing Soviet, or Russian-facing facing allies, uh, are more nervous about Russian ambitions. Definitely. Partly because they're closer. Uh, partly because they believe that they could be the next target or likely will be the next target, and partly because they have extremely recent experience of living under Russia. Uh, Estonia got its independence in 1991, right? Sure. That's like a minute ago for sure. you and me, for younger people watching. <laughs> for you and me, it's like a minute ago. So they remember. I, I, I speak to the Estonian Prime Minister, Kaya Kalas, who's one of the, you know, she's tough, she's educated, she's trying to find the way forward. She grew up under the Soviet Union. Sure. You know, her parents suffered under the Soviet Union. These are not distance mem memories. You don't have to go back to your grandparents. So they have real experience. There, there is less alarm the further you move west, but that's not entirely clear cut because the Brits are certainly very alarmed about where Russia is going. That's why they've been very forward leaning in terms of uh, their weapons supplies to Ukraine, etc. So yes, I, I, would say, I would agree with you that there is some disagreement as to how far Russia will go. For instance, would they attack a NATO ally? Antony Blinken says, I doubt it. Kaya Kalas says, don't doubt it. The question is, what do you do to prevent that even being a possibility? Do, right. do you cede Ukraine? Or do you say, we're not gonna let that stand? Well, let's actually get to that because you, you uh, have a, one of the better histories of the Ukraine war so far that I've read in terms of- Oh, it's gonna be. In, in terms of the back and forth, in terms of, and, and we have arrived at, at this moment to two plus years in of apparent stalemate, let's mm. be fair. You know, the, the, uh, the, counter, the Ukrainian counterattack of 2023 did not work. No. Um, and so the two sides are stuck. Uh, Russia controls, what is it, roughly 18 to 20% of yeah. what was formerly Ukrainian territory. Neither side, I mean, I don't think I'm being outrageous in saying this, neither side can accomplish what they, what they previously defined as victory. Mm -hmm. So what is the outcome that yeah. works to end this conflict, given that Putin's not going to conquer Kyiv mm -hmm. without massive change in things, and the Ukrainians are not getting back 100% of the territory that they lost? Probably not. That, that, that is something you won't hear Zelensky say. Of course. And, and you know, it's interesting, someone described it to me this way, that. We talk about political pressure here, say, over the debate, over Ukraine aid, you know, well, will Trump, you know, send a bad tweet about me if I vote for Ukraine aid, whatever. <laughs> Zelensky's political pressure are tens of thousands of mothers 
who lost their sons and daughters fighting the Russian invasion. Sure. So he's got to, if he's going to cede territory, he's got to go to them and explain why I'm giving it up. I asked your children to die to defend their land. So that, that's an enormous amount of understandable political pressure on, on any deal. The other piece for them is that they don't trust Putin, and, and who would, right? Uh, he's made repeated agreements that he's broken. So if you were to come to a deal and say, okay, that 18%, we're not going to get it back with line of control, security grant guarantees from Europe, et cetera. Their view is, well, he takes two years and then he comes back again. Understandable. So it is like giving Hitler the Sudetenland or exactly, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, th th that's what stands against the simple sort of like, ah, just give him some land and everything will be fine. <laughs> to your point, you know, particularly with Crimea, even less so than Eastern Ukraine, with Crimea, which, which Russia views as a strategic interest to it because it's their warm water port, you know, right. the, the, all that Black Sea fleet, uh, th that the, the likelihood of them giving that up either by agreement or by war is, is low. So how do you, how do you uh, square that circle, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the difficulty, right? But, but going into it, you have to understand Ukraine's point of view in that. And uh, that's why, you know, security guarantees will be part of it. It's interesting. I talked to General Mark Milley in this book. And I mean, he says outright, which is interesting, uh, because a lot of NATO leaders will not say this. He's like, it's probably not going to be in NATO. You know, there'll be some yeah. security guarantee. People mention as an Israeli equivalent as, as a kind of yeah. model where it's a, a security guarantee, but it's not a mutual defense agreement. Uh, because he said, you know, you can NATO truly make a commitment to go to war with Russia if they violate any of these agreements. So you, you begin to hear private discussion of what the outlines might be, right? Some land, a security guarantee just short of NATO, but a real one that counteracts Russia's really lack of sincerity or credibility on any deal. But we're not there yet from, from what I can tell, certainly when I go to Ukraine, because there's very little appetite there for that kind of concession. There is, you know, I really kind of hate to be this person, but in, <laughs> in attempting to understand Vladimir Putin's point of view here, mm. um, it does depend on which parts of history you think are most important. Mm. Um, I don't dispute at all that we've got a, a nation now called Ukraine, which has clearly yeah. expressed the desire to be autonomous, independent, all that stuff. Uh, his argument that until, I think, the time of Khrushchev, Crimea was basically considered part of Russia and right. that it was folded into Ukraine under, the so under right. a Soviet dump, that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that should overrule, but from Putin's point of view, right, there are historical things that he thinks trump this modern liberal democratic notion of what yeah. a nation is, right? Listen, the trouble is that's true of every European nation as it's drawn today. <laughs> yes, that's the right answer. And if the way, <laughs> if the way to solve that is to roll tanks across the border, we got a problem, right? I mean, just listen to the way Xi Jinping makes his argument for Taiwan, or even for the South China Sea, the nine dash line. I mean, you, you, th these guys are always working with maps, right? <laughs> They're always yeah, working yeah. maps to justify their point of view. And yeah. if they don't get what they want, they roll tanks across the border. That, that solution can't, can't work, right? Because then you, you, you just set yourself up for the next land grab. Now, in, in the history, even recent history, where you settled disagreements over land, there's always been some sort of compromise, right? I mean, if you look at the, the, the Good Friday agreements, if you, you, know, you look at attempts to, to settle the agreement, Israel-Palestine, there, there's always land concessions at some point. And the point is, can you get to one that disincentivizes the next land grab by force? Or not just disincentivizes it, but makes them think they can't get away with it. To date, right. we haven't figured, because Putin's calculation is, I can get away with it, because yeah. I got away with it in Georgia, I got away with it in Ukraine in 2014, and I may just get away with it again this time. Um, and, and everybody I talked to for this book in Europe and when I, when I went to Asia and on Capitol Hill, uh, they believe that China is watching how the world deals with Ukraine because that enters into their calculus as to how they deal with Taiwan. So it's the precedent matters. Um, and, and it's not just, I was talking about this last night with, with friends, it's not just because it's right to stand up for sovereign nations or the Ukrainian people who have chosen this as their path or the Taiwanese people who've chosen the status quo as their path. It's because we depend on and benefit from a world where that is not the way you play the game. You know, it, it, that, that's why we can travel and do business in Europe all the way to the East and in Asia and the goods that we buy travel through these shipping lanes and so on 
because that system has largely held, and this threatens that system. Well, and let's let's get so, but Ukraine's not getting Crimea back, are they? I mean, I'm I'm not going to make that decision, <laughs> but I, but I hear you. I I don't see a, personally. I don't see a world where Russia gives that up, right? right? And from a mili military perspective. I don't see, and I've been talking to military folks in the U.S. and Europe for some time, the credible military option for Ukraine to do that successfully. So that points in the direction of some sort of settlement. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk about the, the, one of the biggest challenges to the rules-based order, which is something that I'm guessing you had to fold into this book virtually at the last minute, which is <laughs> suddenly we had October 7th, yes. and we had the aftermath of mm -hmm. October 7th, which obviously you weren't able to put the... but. You know, first of all, we had, of course, the atrocious Hamas attack in yeah. Israel. And then we have had the invasion of Gaza, which has, let's just say this, outraged most of the world mm. and has turned world opinion sharply against Israel and against the United States' support of Israel. How much does that undermine American uh, mm -hmm. credibility and international standing right now? It's a big one. I mean, the, the, I, I found myself uh, in, in Israel, in northern Israel, particularly in October or November, um, thinking about this very question, big picture, but also how this competition fit into that conflict. And, and it presented itself to me, as I mentioned earlier, because Russia immediately got in it. It was already involved, right? It's, yeah. just, it's up there in Syria. But they, they looked for opportunities to upset and destroy and cause havoc. And this is a perfect way to do it. The U.S. is on Israel's side. Hey, let's keep the pressure on them. How about I send a SAM S-300 system to Hezbollah to increase the cost for Israel if it were to attack southern Lebanon? You know, how do I make that war worse? I mean, this is Putin's, you know, extremely cynical, violently cynical thinking. So, Which also this doesn't require him to openly take the side of Hamas. Not right? at all. Yeah. Quietly, he sent it through yeah. the Wagner Group. You and yeah. I both know who runs that, you know. But it's just a little, nice little cutout, get it there. I can, you know, stoke the flames a little bit. So, so it was yet one more front of this great power conflict. So I saw that very quickly. But in terms of U.S. exercise of power, yes, it's, it's a test because you remember early on, Biden's plan was to go to Israel and to Oman right. in the immediate aftermath yes. of this. He went to Israel and he was no longer welcome in Amman. That's when there was the hospital attack initially blamed on, on Israel. Most likely it was not, regardless. And from there it was all downhill because, because whatever push our closest Arab allies gave the Biden administration and whatever pressure, to what degree they pressured Israel to have more respect for civilian lives and, and humanitarian needs, not enough. And by the yeah. way, we're seeing it play out before us. I mean, yeah. the death toll is just horrendous. And, you know, you're airdropping food in now, right, to, to just feed children, you know, who are starving there. So it is a, it's a blow, right, because in that, one, it's not clear that Israel is winning that war, at least by its own definition of success, which yeah. is to eliminate uh, Hamas. A and two, uh, the U.S. has alienated some of its closest allies in the region. Um, and it's not like Russia has done any better or China, right? They haven't, but they love to sit back and watch when the U.S. stumbles. It's a, it's a, it's a situation that is unlikely to have winners, um, mm. that, that particular one. And it's, mm. it's obviously, yeah, an, an incredibly uh, tragic scenario from, from, from all points of view. Is there a resolution that you can imagine, just to mention very briefly, one of your competitors in the national security space. You know, Tom Friedman a few weeks ago floated the idea of a Biden doctrine that mm. was going to bring every bring the Saudis in and create a, pal a framework for a yeah. Palestinian state. That's out the window, as far as I can see, in a less in less than a month. So what? off-ramp is there mm. here for anybody in this conflict? You're talking Israel, Hamas yes. conf conflict yes. specifically? Listen, you know, the, the, I've been going there for 20 years. It seems the outlines have been there for some time. You know, you, you go back to some agreement where, where, there's a, where, where there are land concessions that give both sides the possibility of, and, and I know that if you're in Israel, most people I speak with have lost faith in the possibility sure. of a two-state yeah. solution. Um, Many Palestinians also. 
100%, understandably, and some of them even calculate it might be better to be a voice inside a, a one state. You know, th there are a whole host of calculations there. I mean, the outlines have been there for years. It's just that neither neither party has been able to either has been either willing to make those concessions or have leaders who want to or have leaders who calculate they can get everything or have leaders when you look at Hamas who calculate just an endless state of war serves their interests. So, um, my personal theory of of this is that. Uh, if you look at, say, and again, these are not equivalent conflicts, but they have some parallels. If you look at uh, a South Africa or, or a Northern Ireland situation, mm -hmm. it requires two peacemakers, right? It requires peacemakers. It requires a revolutionary willing to put down their arms, and it requires a more, uh, a more dominant power calculating that they can't win by force of arms. And therefore, willing to make concessions, and you know, the, you plug in your your variables there. A de Klerk and a Mandela, and a and a um, you know, a, a, a Britain and uh, the IRA and, and Sinn Fein, that kind of thing. We haven't seen that those outlines formed. They have lived sometimes at different times. I mean, Yitzhak uh, Rabin yeah. might have been that guy, right? Yasser Arafat had a chance and turned it down, yeah. right? It's not it's not clear who has the leadership, and God knows it won't be Hamas because Hamas has no interest in that kind of deal, and it doesn't seem like Netanyahu does either. <laughs> yeah, that's did, I, not, did I give you an answer? That, 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 <laughs> it, you know, in a sense, yeah. you did, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I it's know. not that far off from Tom Friedman's view. It's just that, you know, what are the ingredients? And by the way, you need a strong U.S., right? A, a U.S. leader who's invested in that as which well. Is, which is, an, which is an, an issue right now. Um, there's so much more that we could talk about, but it's irresistible to ask you about Donald Trump because mm. you're generally not a political commentator. That's not your role. You know, you, you've, you've talked, you talk in this book to John Bolton mm -hmm. and John Kelly. You also talked to Tony Blinken. So you've got people who are Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. probably neither or in between. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you have talked to people on the right and the left in lots, of, in lots of other countries as well. But you do seem to have a particular attitude here about the danger presented by uh, the potential election of Donald Trump to a second term. Listen, he and th th this is based on his own former senior advisors, as you yes. mentioned. John Kelly was his chief of staff. John Bolton was his national security advisor. Matt Pottinger was was his main China guy, right? Yeah. And, and they say in no uncertain terms that in a second term, a second Trump term, that he would be likely to move the U.S. out of NATO, pull the U.S. out, or at least neuter NATO uh, to the point where it make it clear that he's not that Article 5 is not something that he as commander in chief Which is would Article feel. 5 is the necessity of defending yes, an, a NATO defend. country that is under attack. Right? Um, and, and he has a similar attitude towards other U.S. defense commitments. Uh, he was going to reduce, you may remember, U.S. troop deployments to South to Korea. Not, you know, it's, it's too expensive for us. Not really my problem. And do we really need to go to war to defend Japan? Taiwan, I, I tell a story in here that, that Bolton tells. The tip of the Sharpie. <laughs> he would sit in the office, he would point to the tip of a Sharpie and say, that's Taiwan. He would point to his resolute desk and say, that's China. To make the point, Taiwan is so small, stands no chance against China, and therefore we have no business defending it. So it would be a retreat from U.S. alliances and, uh, and an, an accommodation with the Putins and the Xi's of the world. Uh, and he's, and again, this is not, uh, my uh, vague sense of this, his own advisors have said it, and he himself has said it, right? Um, he admires the leadership of Putin and Xi. I can, I can do deals with them, um, which, by the way, I find uh, not credible because it's very clear that China and Russia do not have our best interests at heart. They, they, they want to bring down the U.S. and they want to bring down the international system that we have profited from. So whatever he thinks of his own diplomatic skills, that's not what they're interested in. Um, so that, uh, and here's the thing, in November, there's a very clear choice on a lot of things, and, and folks may want to make this choice, but that Biden and Trump have diametrically opposed uh, ways of dealing with this. Biden is a more traditional, what used to be bipartisan approach, stand up for American allies, defense alliances, etc. Trump he calculates it's in America's interest to retreat from those commitments and just find a way to accommodate or appease. Well, it, it does strike me that those <laughs> two guys in particular think that they're smarter than him and can play him. Is that unfair? Uh, you're talking about... She and Putin? Uh, can, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and listen, you know, 
Is it to Putin's advantage to have Trump push House Republicans to, avoid, to block Ukraine aid? Absolutely. No, obviously. Now, now, Trump seems to calculate we don't have any business. We don't have any business there. But it's certainly in Putin, Putin's interest. So he's he's cheering things like that, and he's also cheering the domestic division, right? To have an American sure. leader who says sure. that his country is being destroyed, that might be the most important their interest. thing. Yes. yes. Uh, last question, which is, let, let's do a meta question about the media very quickly. A topic that we could keep going on. You know, working at CNN, largely talking to people from you know, various degrees of, 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 of officialdom, to use a bad word, the establishment, mm. uh, sometimes referred to as the blob. Um, <laughs> but it, it, I'm sure you encounter all the time people on the right and sometimes on the left saying, this is establishment journalism, this is mainstream journalism, mm. this is corporate journalism, we don't believe you anymore. Yeah. Um, what is your response or how do you react to that sort of lo loss of institutional trust? Oh, it's, as an American, it's a shame, right? Because we, we, and it's across the board, loss of trust in institutions, uh, you name it, from, from, you know, the media to, to government, to the Supreme Court, to professional sports, right? I mean, you know, each one of the, the church, you know, so it's across the board. My answer is, uh, listen, I've done the work. I've gone to these places. I'm not, I'm not theorizing from my couch in Washington. I've gone to Ukraine. I've gone to Taiwan. I've met these people. These are, this is what they're saying. You know, for instance, one response I'll give when folks say, well, Putin may be right about Ukraine or about Estonia. And I say, well, ask the Estonians and the Ukrainians. It, you know, if, you, if you're a freedom person, they've made their choice clear. They, and, and they're pretty darn close to it and they've lived through it. So, so maybe they have something to say and some credibility in what they say about what it would look like for them. I try to do that. I do find that on, on these issues in general, well, I was going to say there is agreement. There has been agreement uh, across party lines. <laughs> yeah. The, the trouble maybe today, not now. No, maybe not less so, less so. I still think that's a minority that, that is a true kind of isolationist American first, but, but it's real. There's no question. It's not the first time we've had it, as no. you know, in this country, uh, even going back to 1939, we had it. Um, what I worry is that the bubbles are so separate and increasingly impenetrable. So I could do the work and I could talk to folks from both sides and both administrations and both parties and travel the world. But the chances of, you know, I'm doing that in this bubble and the chances of hopping into this bubble to make that case became, become fewer and fewer over time. And that's not just me. I mean, we, we all experience this on sure. any issue, right? And that part is the one that worries me the, bo the most is that uh, it's hard to, to penetrate the, those separate bubbles. I will say there are times at the start of the invasion, um, Republicans and Democrats, CNN watchers, non-CNN watchers came up to me and said, you guys are doing such great work there, you know? And, and uh, so I think there are times when it breaks through, but those times are becoming um, less common. Jim Shuto, uh, CNN national security analyst and, uh, and reporter, and the author of the really interesting new book, new book, The Return of Great Powers. You should read it. Thank you so much for thanks, coming in. Thanks Jim. for having me. I really appreciate the conversation.